Welcome everybody to this Designing Native Habitat in Gardens workshop. Um, so thank you for those of you who actually made it in real life to our event. We've also got people online speaking through Zoom. So please bear with us with the technology and the camera movements. Uh, so this workshop is brought to you by Waverley Council, Willara Council and Randwick Council and also by the New South Wales Environmental Trust. I am Vicky Bachelard, I work at Waverley Council in the sustainability team and I coordinate the Living Connections programme which um, is the, it's an environmental trust grant funded programme where we help residents create small bird habitat in their gardens and that's why we're putting on this workshop today to support that programme. Um, because it seems that the natural next step to, we've been talking to residents about creating habitats and now we need to talk to the professional gardeners and you guys. So if you haven't already checked in, done your COVID check-in, could you please go and do that? Um, and I think just help for people in the room, just help yourself to some tea and coffee and refreshments. Uh, we're going to go through till about 5.30. Um, for those of you in the room, to get to the toilets, we need to go outside in the outdoor world, I'm afraid, out of this door and go two doors down and then back in again. There is going to be a class happening in the next room, so we can't walk through there. If you're at home on Zoom, go to the toilet anytime you like. Um, so we've got three presentations today. Um, and we've got... Um, oh, this is over there. <laughs> so we've got four guest speakers today. Um, I'm going to introduce them. So, Narelle Hack, who's sitting in the middle over here. Narelle is a garden designer, horticulturalist, who specialises in native garden and permaculture design. She has over 15 years experience and is passionate about creating living spaces which are nurturing, productive and sustainable. Narelle has a garden design company called Garden for Life and offers native garden and permaculture design services as well as a range of educational workshops. We also have Steve Batley. Steve is a landscape architect, a permaculture designer, an educator, and he describes himself as an urban farm creator. Steve has over 20 years of practical application designing, building and managing permaculture-based ecosystems. Steve is the director of Sydney Organic Gardens, and he loves giving people the skills, knowledge, and mindset to manage their own productive ecosystem. He works with architects, planners, landscape architects, developers, and the public to provide specialist design and advice, as well as education. And we have Mark DeWall. Mark is a horticulturist and garden designer with extensive knowledge in bush regeneration and creating wildlife-friendly gardens. Mark has been working with clients to create native gardens since 2003. He conducts bush regeneration along Sydney's coastal region, the national parks, golf courses and councils, including Waverley Council. Mark has his own business called Lands Landmark Gardens, and he also works with Waverley Council on our Living Connection programme, providing advice to the residents. And our fourth guest speaker is Sue Stevens. Stu, Sue is the Urban Ecology, Urban Ecology Coordinator at Waverley Council, where she oversees the implementation of natural resource management, bush regeneration, and protection of the ecological communities. Sue has a holistic and action-focused approach to ecological restoration work that centres on the repair and recreation of natural landscapes and fauna habitat. As part of Sue's postgraduate studies in natural resource management, she completed a research project and thesis on small bird habitat in the urban landscape. Sue's areas of special interest include native vegetation, birds, the importance of plants and nature for human health, and the space where art and environmental restoration intersects. Um, for those of you online, um, if you have any questions, we're going to, in between each presentation, we'll have time for questions. So if anything comes up for you, please put it, put it in the chat and Michelle will respond or, and ask those at the right time. Um, I know a lot of you did submit some questions when you registered for the workshop, so thank you for those. I think a lot of them will get answered during the presentations. 
um, but I have got a list of them and we'll try to bring those in as well when we can. Okay, so we're going to hear from Sue first. Um, Sue is presenting on the issues surrounding the loss of small birds in the urban environment and what the requirements are of small birds and how we can introduce those into our gardens. Hi, and good afternoon. Good afternoon to you in the room. You seem quite far away. Um, <coughs> good afternoon to you on Zoom. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the Eastern Sydney coastal area. Um, just get, I haven't got the screen sharing yet. I haven't got the screen sharing up yet. Just um, so before I, I um, do an acknowledgement, I will just make an apology. Um, there were some bird call sounds in my presentation that seemed to have um, flown away. So um, that'll be just me speaking. Okay, right. Um, so, yes, uh, Vicky said I'm the Council's, uh, work Waverley Council's Urban Ecology Coordinator. I've also worked for five other councils um, in the bush regeneration industry and as a consultant to councils, NGOs and landscape architects in private practice. Um, I'd like to <laughs> acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the Eastern Sydney coastal area, the Bidjigal and Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and um, for wherever you're coming from soon, uh, the traditional custodians of wherever you are and acknowledge their um, elders past and present. And just while we're on the topic of um, acknowledgement and reconciliation, restoring biodiversity and creating habitat is caring for country and action and is a powerful act of reconciliation. Whether you're doing it as bush regenerator or on private land, you're restoring something that we need that balance of um, ecology. There's been a lot of research and reporting in recent years of the benefits of being in nature and a lot of us over the last 12 or 15 months of experiences for ourselves, um, as many of us, not me, have uh, had a chance to slow down and explore our local parks and urban bushland. And early research um, from 1984 found that people recovering from stomach surgery healed faster when they had a view of a garden compared to those looking out onto a brick wall. Subsequent studies have not only just confirmed this, but found that it's the diversity of the greenness that facilitates recovery and well-being. In other words, being, or being in or viewing a garden with a wide diversity of plant species plant habitats and flowering times is better for your physical and mental health than looking at a row of the same trees or a neatly mowed lawn. So we have to um, get this message across to the fashion of landscape design and also um, some of those TV shows. Um, and, so, and anyone who knows, who's spent time in nature knows that a bushwalk is more interesting and makes you feel better than a walk across a playing field. You can observe the wonders of birds and insects, whether it's on a 20k bushwalk or having a cup of tea in the garden. Even small inner city backyards can have a great variety of native bees, butterflies, dragonflies and so on. Diversity of plants and small fauna add to the aesthetics and beauty of our surroundings in both clearly visible and more subtle ways. The work you do as landscapers and designers, if done in a thoughtful, conscious way, can be of benefit to the wildlife and can improve human well-being because everything's connected. Increasing floristic diversity in parks and gardens provides more opportunities for other plants and animals to find a home, to survive and to thrive. For example, by providing habitat for bird, insect and bat pollinators. So today I'm going to talk about um, small bird habitat. As Vicky mentioned, the Living Connections Project wanted to specifically address the loss of small birds in our eastern suburbs landscape. Um, and we chose two species, the New Holland honey eater and the superb prairie wren as our flagship species. But as, 
as everything is connected, other small bird species and fauna such as insects and lizards will also benefit from improving diversity in our gardens. One of the main issues for these small birds is that the shrub layer is gone and these birds really don't have anywhere left to hide from predators and aggressive species or to raise a family or move through the landscape. And for insectivores, a lot of the food source is gone as well. I'm going to talk about how to go about trying to restore this habitat for small birds so that we can repopulate our parks and gardens and move towards restoring some of the balance that has gone away of the bigger, more aggressive and carnivorous birds. Specifically, I'm going to talk about structure of vegetation, plant species, ones to include and ones not to include, and other important factors like um, predators and bullies. Uh, if you have any questions, please, for those in the room, please write them down. If you're on Zoom, please um, put them in the chat. Now, the next screen was going to have a bird sound of an eastern spinebill. Um, it's all that, that disappeared from our landscape in the city. There might be some in the national parks or um, in more rural areas, but you don't really see them around here anymore. And this is a common story for small birds. Um, the museum, Australian Museum has data from birds from 1900. And a researcher in the year 2000 compared current bird species in Sydney to that museum data. And they found that there was a lot more now. Um, there's a lot more carnivorous birds. There's a lot more bigger birds, whether it's cockatoos or um, bigger honey eaters, and a lot less small birds. And as an example, only um, two species of parrot were present in Sydney in 1900, um, and they were small parrots. One, one of those was the ground parrot, and there was no rainbow lorikeets, there was no sulphur-crested cockatoos. So we've really changed things towards benefiting bigger, carnivorous and more aggressive birds. Um, another bird that We've still got hanging in a little bit is um, the grey fantail. The new hole of honey eater is hanging in not quite so well as the next bird, but it's still there and it's one of our flagship species for our project. And the superb fairy then. Um, Everyone loves the superb fairy wren, and if I have time, I will tell you a story about their promiscuous ways. Um, but look, small birds can't fly far. They're not like bigger birds. They really need lots of stepping stones through the landscape, and they need um, shelter whenever they stop. Otherwise, they're going to be swooped by um, a predator. And it's that shrub layer that they used to use um, that's disappeared a lot from our landscape. You go to a park and you've often got trees and grass or low ground covers and that whole shrub layer that's 1.5 to 3 metres high has, has just disappeared. So most of the next part of this talk will be about the superb fairy wren because we've got more data. Everyone loves the superb fairy wren. They're cute, they're colourful and uh, consequently some re more research has been done on what they like and what they don't like. This is a map of superb fairy wren sightings in the eastern suburbs. You can see there's a lot along the coastline and then there's a big concentration in Centennial Park and another cluster down here at Randwick Environment Park. So there's no way really for those Centennial Park birds to get through the landscape and meet up with those coastal ones and, and interbreed and create more families. We don't think. Here's a bit closer, uh, closer in example of the same kind of data, but this researcher has, as well as marked on the map where there are superb fairy wrens, has also marked where there are not superb fairy wrens. So the first map, we just knew where they were. Um, but this researcher has actually gone to public parks in between the coast and Centennial Park and found that there are none. Um, we don't know too much about what's on private property because that involves a big citizen science project that would involve surveying a lot of residents. And we have included surveys as part of the Living Connections program, but it's not reaching 
everyone. Um, sort of above Centennial Park, there's a nice grid suburb um, to, above the eastern side of Centennial Park. That's Queen's Park, the suburb of Queen's Park. And Queen's Park is quite a leafy suburb. It's got some really lovely big street trees. But um, do we think it's really good for small birds? Um, from what I'm hearing from residents who bring me up and say that they used to have small birds and they've gone um, and that they've been eaten by other larger birds, I would suspect that the trees are being a really good habitat for larger birds to move around, but the small birds just can't survive. And a lot of uh, government, both at state and local council area uh, levels, map habitat corridors from that kind of aerial, look, that's where the greenness is, so that's where we'll map our corridors. So um, here's a map of the whole of Eastern Sydney with the habitat corridors marked in orange. And it's really just mapping where there's big patches of green. So it's not always the right habitat for small fauna. Um, and I'd argue that it's right habitat for large fauna and not much more. Um, oh. um, birds like carawongs that are known predators of fairy wrens and their eggs and other um, small birds, as well as reptiles, and all those fruits on those lily pillies that everyone loves planting, any small colourful fruits, the caramon will be attracted to those too. Blueberry ash, all those trees we, we love to recommend. Of course, there's other reasons that we're losing small birds. Um, we all know about cats, so I won't bang on about cats. Um, and But these carnivorous birds are quite responsible for quite a few fairy wrens. Disappearances. Um, this is a juvenile butcher bird with a male fairy wren in his bed here. So we need to put back some of that habitat for the small birds. But what are we going to plant? A lot of people will say plant Australian natives, like this one. Um, but this is probably not the right species for a small bird. Um, wild noisy miners don't eat um, small birds. They are aggressive, they hang around in packs and they'll chase just about any other bird, even those much bigger than themselves, and um, cats and other animals out of their territory. And I'll talk a bit more about noisy miners in a bit, but um, one of the points I really want to get through to this to the message on this presentation is that not all natives are the same in terms of bird habitat or small bird habitat. This is what came up when I Googled Australian native garden. Um, does anyone want to uh, offer some suggestions why this might not be good small bird habitat? Um, I'd say that there's not very much um, vegetation there at all. And there's only one species of plants, some smaller, large um, grass trees. The next seven slides I'm going to show are of what is a bit more like the kind of habitat we need to be looking at putting into residential gardens and even in parklands. And I'm not trying to say that it's all going to be like this, but we need pockets, corners, thickets, clumps of something like this. Um, and things to note in this particular slide are the diversity of plants and plantings. Um, there are lots of different shapes of plants, different heights, grasses, shrubs, um, bigger shrubs, smaller shrubs. There's um, no brightly coloured bottle brush flowers and they're mostly small flowers. So um, the noisy miners and those bully birds are attracted to the big showy flowers, red ones, orange ones, 
and the flowers that are on the outside of the plant, whereas insects are attracted to white, cream, yellow, purple, and blue flowers, and often they're small flowers, not always. And then when the insects are attracted, then the insect eating birds are going to be attracted to, like this. Um, this is a beetle on a tea tree. Um, and the density is really important. Um, you wouldn't actually know what's on the other side of these shrubs. It could be someone's house wall, it could be the fence, it could be the front fence. In fact, on the other side of that particular planting is a river, but you wouldn't know because it's so dense you can't see daylight through. And my rule of thumb is if you can put your arm through into the shrubbery, then a bird the size of a carawong can also get in. So it's got to be that dense that you can't really get inside at all. And you can do that by planting closely together, planting different heights of shrubs. And in this image, there are also vines such as hardened virgin climbing over to even increase that density further. Here's a fairy wren inside some dense planting. And you can see he's right, he's right inside. And he must be feeling safe because I got quite close to take that photo. And he's not far off the ground. Uh, tangled branches, uh, they, like, they like tangled branches to be safe, again, that protection from predators. Um, some leaf litter and a bit of messiness for some invertebrate habitat. It doesn't have to be the whole garden, just a corner uh, where some insects can survive and thrive and the birds will find it. And of course, water. We all need water, birds need water, particularly on hot days, but the bird bath needs to be somewhere close to some shrubbery or somewhere that they can quickly jump out and hide in if predators come along. And it has to have water in it. Unlike this one, which is um, wrong for a number of reasons. Firstly, it doesn't have any water in it. Um, secondly, it's not too close to anything dense and safe to hide in. But the main thing that I think is particularly wrong with this bird bath is that it's really steep. The side's really steep and the bird's not going to feel safe there because if it fills up with rain, they will um, be afraid of drowning and they won't want to use it. So a bit more about, oh, the um, hair has disappeared. This, is, um, this slide is about planting for nectivores. So those birds like uh, Eastern Spinebill, New Holland Honey Eater, and the White Plume Honey Eater. They like anything with nectar, but not those big showy ones. So Banksias are good. A lot of the Melaleucas are good. The Packards are great. Um, you can see in this image of the, um, I think it's a, someone help me, it's a Stifilia, no. Um, one of those <laughs> Epacrids. It's got a long tube-shaped flower and it perfectly matches the beak shape of those honey eaters like that Eastern Spinebill and the New Holland honey eater. This slide says at the top, planting for insectivores. Um, of course, they're anywhere with insects. So we have a fairy wren, um, an Eastern yellow robin, a pardal oak, thank you, and a woolly wagtail, and they like anywhere with insects. So insect attracting plants could be acacias, leptospermums, native peas, herbertias, lawn mulch and leaf litter. Oh, Julian, I can't go to the next slide now. Please. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. We're back. Um, so I guess even small birds like fairy wrens do like foraging on lawns. They do need somewhere to run and hide. But um, for our Waverley Council staff here, this is actually at Bronte Beach, <laughs> Bronte Park, right near where the little train is. Um, this is just down the road from that last photo. And this is fantastic, superb fairy wren habit, habitat. It's got dense tangled shrubs and no trees for 
um, predator birds like caramongs to hang out in. And this is a spot that I could just about go to any time and find some fairy, fairy wrens. A bit more about plant selection um, and a bit, a bit of repetition. Uh, choose plants that attract insects. Flower, choose plants that flower at various times of the year, so you, you have you're attracting insects not just at one time of the year. Um, Leptospermums, melaleucas, acacias, corias, cactus, bursaria, and astringia can all be good. Um, but the important thing is shrubs between one and three metres tall, and they don't have to all be native plants. And they, um, it's the structure and it's the density of the planting, that's the important thing. And at Waverley, we require 50% um, of the trees, 50% of the shrubs and 50% of the grasses and ground covers to be locally Indigenous species. If landscaping um, is occurring on a new development, that's within a designated habitat corridor. But it's probably not a bad rule to follow for any garden, to go for the at least 50% and have at least those three layers of vegetation canopy, whether that's trees or high shrubs, then a middle layer of other shrubs and then a ground and grass cover, ground cover and grass layer. And you can include non-natives in that. Um, lemon trees we know are fantastic for attracting superb fairy wrens. The aphids come to the lemon trees and the fairy wrens come to the aphids. Climbing roses, um, ornamental species, um, old, old school plants like plumbagos are great. Um, and I'm even going to put myself out there and say lantana is great in the city. Um, I wouldn't recommend it up the north coast or somewhere where there's bushland, but the benefits of lantana for small birds far outweigh the um, the weed nuisance that they can have um, cause in the city. Then you've got the other non-native non climbers like bougainvilleas, honeysuckle, jasmine. They've all been found to be great small bird habitat. But as I mentioned already, not planting certain species is just as important. Please avoid planting hybrid grevilleas, robin gordon, sander gordon, the other gordon, um, <laughs> those ones that are really popular, um, and the bottle brush, uh, those red, red, bright red bottle brushes, because they will attract noisy miners, and noisy miners will just dominate the territory, and there won't be any other bird species around. And that, it's a bit sad that for the last 40 years we've been encouraged to plant these big flowery flowers. Natives because it's probably going to take a while to undo the damage that that's caused. Um, this is not just a problem for small bird species, as I mentioned, it's also larger birds and, and other animals, just noisy miners are just so aggressive and so dominant. Um, to demonstrate that, here's a graph of Percentage of gardens with small burn species when there are noisy miners and when there are not noisy miners. So the blue columns are gardens with no noisy miners and how many small bird species. And then the red column is the gardens where there are noisy miners. So in every single case, the fairy wren, the uh, red brown finch, uh, eastern spinebill, silver eye, eastern yellow robin, new holland honey eater, and a willy wagtail. Lots more of those when there's no noisy miners in the garden. And here's a drawing of sort of the top part of the drawing is a typical planting design. Plant some trees, put them in rows, put spaces in between them. And the lower picture is how to plant so that the noisy miners don't have that habitat that they can swoop through in between the trees and chase all the other birds out. It's got layers, it's, there's no spaces between the plants and it's got a, quite a diversity of tall shrubs, small shrubs, grasses, vines, etc. And here's a sort of bird's eye view of the same kind of concept. Um, instead of same species in a row, or you know, keep those, and then just fill it in with other species and don't have a straight edge so that the 
there are little keyhole shapes and other nooks and crannies for small birds to, to hide in. Um, I'm just going to show you a few slides now of some gardens that go some way to fulfilling that vision. Um, this one's good. It's got foraging area on lawn with some other um, with shrubs right beside the lawn, different layers, got quite a diversity of species. Same again here. It's even got a little sort of a circular lawn in the middle of all those shrubs so that if a predator comes here, that bird's got options of which way it can run and hide or fly and hide. Um, bird bath here is in a great position with um, shrubs all around it. Again, that's uh, that's hiding a fence. You can see sort of in the shadow that might be a fence, but it's pretty well concealed. A variety of species. Nice dense planting. You can make uh, native plantings look non-messy if you want to do a lot of pruning and um, just sort of regular tip pruning to make nice shapes so that birds don't mind if the west ridge is in a nice ball or it's a bit more, bit more scraggly. Um, here we've got some good mulch area and this one um, is not, there's no, not a native in sight. Uh, I don't think there's anything planted in the ground but it's still got somewhere that a small bird could stop off flying through the landscape um, in, that's safe in that um, bougainvillea. This one's on a rooftop, probably needs a bit more um, mid-story, but it's not bad for a rooftop garden. Um, this is another really nice one. Again, might need a bit more mid-story, but lots of nice diverse natives there. Uh, and these two are public places. This is... Um, some plantings that we've done in recent years at Waverley, Corriers and Westringes, that's very popular with fairy events now. It's grown, it took about 18 months to two years to grow to a size that they um, felt comfortable in using. Oh, it's a slide missing, never mind. Um, lastly, I just want to talk about some research uh, resources that you can look up and find out a bit more for yourself. The Birds in Backyards Guidelines for Bird Habitat's great. They've got downloadable fact sheets for all different kinds of purposes, domestic gardens, schools, landscape architects um, and the like. And of course, Birds in Backyards is a great resource for any information about birds, whether you want to know what they sound like, look, look like. They've got a great bird finder. You can just put in the shape of the bird and um, it'll come up with some options to help you narrow down what you're looking at. This is from Habitat Network. It's a really nice um, diagram about how to plant different layers in a circular kind of pattern so that the birds have got the inner sanctum where they can spend some time, the protective circle, which is the prickly shrubs. Um, and that's the first time I'm saying prickly shrubs in this presentation for a reason, because I don't think they're really great for stepping stones or too much um, habitat, but I do know that birds like to nest in there and it's good to keep cats out of other shrubs behind them. And then there's some um, insect attracting plants on the outer side. So this circular idea can be um, looked at again from above and there's some lines drawn across here to, to demonstrate that it doesn't have to be a big space. If you're in a public space, you might want to do all of those circles, but if you're in a backyard and you don't want to do the whole backyard like this, you could just do a little pie slice in the corner and still have some inner sanctum plants, protective and biodiverse uh, insect attracting plants on the outside. So you can scale it up or down. The uh, Habitat Network has um, lots of great uh, species recommendations too. You can see on the right hand side of that slide. Uh, then there's Habitat Stepping Stones, which some councils have signed up to. And you can look up your council area and it will give you um, suitable species to plant in your garden. And it gives uh, quite a, a nice profile of each plant what species of birds and insects they might attract, how big they're going to grow, what time they flower. 
and that sort of thing. Um, there's also the Glebe Society. This is a this is one I did for the Glebe Society a few years ago. But in the back of that document is a, a species list and some other drawings, and that's on glebesociety.org. So um, I'll end it there with um, just some sum up some top tips. Make sure your shrubs reach all the way to the ground. Plant thick, densely. Think of clumps and thickets. Avoid the big showy bird species, um, the Vimea species. Don't forget water. Uh, I haven't mentioned much about insects because that's going to be Steve's thing. Um, but I would say don't use any insect pesticides, whether it's the natural organic kind or the more poisonous kind, because they all get rid of insects. We, I think we're losing a lot of our insect eating species because we're losing insects. Um, I think that's it for me, and I will pass it back to Vicky and for question time. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Sue. I've been trying to explain the great love story of how to for birds in Barn Farm. And they tell me they, they can't do it, they won't do it because um, so the police, when the police drive around, they went up and get out of the car. They want to be able to see into the park. So they all the trees are cut. Um, all the undergrowth is cut so that, so that you can see into the park. I mean, is there, is there a way of dealing with that? We did do a, a tree planting at Barn Park for National Tree Day, which would have been understory or and shrubs for small birds. Do you have a comment on that? I don't have any non-controversial comments. Um, <laughs> I think it's quite a common point that um, there's been a lot of talk. Um, not so much recently, but in you know, um, in the days when there was quite a lot of bag snatchings and things like that, that shrubs were bad. Shrubs were where criminals would hide, and uh, so get rid of all the shrubs and you'll get rid of the criminals. Of course, we've moved on now. Um, most criminals are online and they don't hide in shrubs, okay. and so I really don't think it's a big issue now, even if it ever was. Um, but there are a, there's still a lot of people with that that kind of thinking. Um, we are trying to build up shrub layers in, in places that we can, and we did do the National Tree Day planting at Varna Park, um, and we and we want to keep rolling that out. But it's not the way everybody wants to see the landscape. There's there's still a fear factor around shrubs, which I think we've really got to move on. So there's a division within council as to sort of management of the parks. Council has quite a number of different departments that manage parks. As an urban ecology department, that's my vision. Um, it might not be shared by everyone. But I think I'm going to say So just a comment from here in the chat is that um, Barnes Park, um, on diet and around the area has been stripped uh, of shrubs as well. Feedback about areas where, where there's been a loss. Yeah. yeah. Um, look, some of them were lost for a whole lot of reasons. I don't want to um, encourage too much council bashing. Um, I think we might want to talk more about positive things and how we can create habitat. Um, Mark's Park has had some plants disappear, but we, we're putting some back to it's you know, plants are living things. They're not the sort of thing that you put there like building a house and it's going to stay there for 20 years. You have to keep looking after them, replacing things that are lost. That's how it is with living things. Michelle, are there any questions on the chat? That's pretty much it. Um, just the other thing was, was just checking that the slides will be shared with everyone afterwards. So we are sending out yes, all so in the slides and other things. So we are recording the session, or we'll be sending out a, a resource page and um, recording of the workshop. Um, so there's a, a question that was asked 
uh, prior to tonight. Um, or to do, and maybe Mark could answer this as well. What species can work well in urban areas alongside footpaths that can withstand some rough from the industrial? Do you want to answer that? Or? Um, I would just go for some tough ground covers. I'm not going to go into particular species because there's a whole lot of variables. Is it in the shade? Is it in the sun? What kind of soil have you got? What kind of um, water runoff do you have? So recommending it certain species without knowing anything else is probably not a good idea. Um, but there's quite a number of quite hardy ground covers, even native grasses such as basket grass can, could be really useful. Um, they can be trodden on without too much damage being done. Can I just talk about that town? I'm involved in this sort of stuff. And I, I cleared a lot of uh, land town. I found that I, I suddenly lost my fairy wrens. As a result, I think I suspect that they were, and I'm just reinforcing what you were saying. Okay. But, and that was a dilemma for me. Wanting to yeah. plant a native garden and having tons of that time. Yes, yeah, so I think we've got to take a much more holistic view and a, a, um, a list of that sort of native is good, weeds is bad kind of view if you want to have habitat. I think a lot of um, future generations started off with a plant based kind of perspective and it was just about plants, this is good, this is bad, but we know now after doing future generations. Do you just want native plants or do you want some, some more life that um, but will they come back if I remove that plants that you're suggesting? It depends if they can get there. Is this stepping stones and corridors from somewhere that they're yeah. currently living? If yeah. they can get in and out, um, do you have a new space? It's possible. Um, every season, the females get kicked out of the family group and they have to go and find a new territory. So if there's a way to get there, then it's, it's possible. Would you suggest doing it bit by bit, staging? Um, staging my time, remember? Yeah, very, very, very slowly. Um, make sure that the shrubs that you're replacing are main time with um, grow to the same size and density of that the main time was before you remove the next thing. I think we might move on now. Um, I'm going to hear from Noel next. Do you want to stop Francis or we can We're also going to delve a little bit deeper into garden design using that to the park. Um, yeah, sure. Like the Hi everyone, my name is Mariah. I'm from uh, a garden of life, so I specialize in native plant design, garden design, and I have my own business at Garden of Life, but I also work and design for Sydney Wildflower Nursery, which is the native nursery down at Heathcote in the National Park. So I've been um, designing for them for a very long time, um, which is something I I still stay designing for them because I actually think it keeps me in touch with the plants quite closely. Um, so I was trying to find some images of gardens that, um, a few examples of gardens that I've created with some clients who are very keen on birdscaping. So I'm, when I go to people's gardens, they kind of, there's a couple of, it's very, as 
Others just wanted to take it as many different types of clients, and some of them just want a guide in which you put it in, and they, they've got no attachment to it, and others will have quite a big discussion with you. I find one of the hardest things to get people to change is the front lawn. Everyone seems to love a front lawn, and one of my first questions will say, how do you feel about getting rid of your front lawn? Because if, if you have a family and you want to create a garden to be involved with not only you, but your children, say, or entertaining, but then you also want to create a native habitat, then maybe start in the front because you may be using your backyard for a lot more things, but I think the front yard is like a key space that can, can be used for habitat and a lot more people are embracing it. I do find some people are still attached to the lawnmower and want to keep some of that, which we were saying before is actually okay because it's good to have a bit of lawn there. But say, for example, this client, she... Her and her husband decided that she would have the front garden and he would have the back. And I had two different separate consultations with this couple. So I had one consultation with her, and this is actually a front verge. And we started um, on the front verge because it literally, as most front verges, are just grass. And there was a there wasn't any policy at this time. So I'm in the Wollongong Council. There is now a verge policy, which is fantastic. Um, but at the time, I had to go and ask permission, and we had to show the design and talk about the plants that we were going to use, which was great because at least they were interested in what we were doing. So she took out some of the lawn um, against the fence because this was just a fence with lawn all the way to the verge. Um, can I go forward on this? Is it just that? All right. That's it now. That same one. So that's what we just first started, and that's quite densely grown now. But what I pointed out to her is she planned, she wanted to keep it very close to the fence and there was still a lot of open lawn um, leading up to that. So now what we've done is we've allowed just a small pathway to the middle and she's actually densely planted with low planting all on the other side, which is close to the gutter. So there's actually a space to hop over and not just have this very exposed, dense area there. She's actually got one next to it as well. So it was a vast improvement. You can't see the fence anymore, which is perfect for me because especially when I go to people's houses and colour bond fencing is like a disease in the um, urban area. And to me, if you can cover it with something like that instead, it's twofold, it's reducing heat in your garden, it's creating habitat for the birds um, and it's an attractive space. Um, this was her husband's backyard. <laughs> so. He, again, it was literally just a rectangular lawn. And so we took out a lot of the lawn. He's still got his veggie patch and the lawn on the other side. But we densely planted with a lot of local, low-growing species. They wanted to keep the palms and a couple of other larger things. But you can see that we've used a lot of very low-growing, dense plantings there so that the birds have got a lot of habitat. And he's, he's quite keen and has been recording a lot of small bird species in that garden since. But when it was just a lawn with a palm tree by itself and some lily trees on the side, there was pretty much not much activity at all. Um, the other problem that people have, and this is just an example of foliage, um, people sort of talk to me about native guns, oh, but isn't it just scrubby and it's a little bit ugly and it's all messy? And I think you don't have to have your garden like that. If, you, if you're in a small space, you, if you're pruning your garden, or maintaining the garden, making sure the plants are fed and mulched, um, and you are repeating some of the same plants through the space, you can actually achieve all the things that we've just spoken about with bird habitat, and you can have a really attractive space as well. So this was a front lawn that was just a sloping front lawn with nothing in it, and they thankfully took out the entire front lawn. And it's grown quite well, and you can see there's quite a few different species in there. There's kangaroo causes, with students with a salt bush, there's acacias, and there's lots of different grasses. And it's a beautiful garden. I think there's another shot over there. This is still probably, it's only about two years old at this stage, so it's grown a lot more since then. But it's um, a beautiful space for habitat. It's got aeromophilus in there, um, some banksias. But you can see it's aesthetically, it was quite a pleasing. Um, um, space to be looking at as well. It's much nicer than she said at the tours of the street because every other house in that street has just a front lawn. So um, the only issue I guess with that is 
encouraging others to do their front lawns as well so that there's somewhere for those birds to travel because she's isolated, obviously, with all the other lawns. So it's encouraging other people. And by doing gardens like this, it actually gets people excited and then they want to start doing it too. And you'll find people chipping away and starting to put gardens in. Um, this is a very, very recent garden that was planted in a disability service. So I've done quite a few habitat gardens for um, people with disabilities because um, they've obviously, this place was a, um, people are actually, they can't leave there. So these were adults. And they said one of the people wanted to come with, they loved water. So we said, well, let's create some water. And this will grow. As you can see, the plants are very tiny so far. But this is an area that was just lawn before, all lawn. And beyond it, you can see beyond the fence, that was all lawn. So now this has been created with a lot of very low growing species and um, a water source as well. And beyond the fence, it is now not lawn anymore either. There's a lot of plantings there. So the birds have got a beautiful space to. Great, but it's also aesthetically for people with mental health issues and intellectual disabilities, this is a really important space for them. And they've found that a lot of people living there now are a lot calmer because they've got this habitat rather than just walking out into a, just a vast worn area with nothing nothing for them to do. So that's another shot of it there. And you can see it's all, once it grows up, it's going to be quite a beautiful space. Um, this is a garden that was created um, last year and again they wanted to share the space with um, plants and animals and obviously they were quite into entertaining. The only thing I wasn't that keen on, you could, that little circle in the middle, they put a big gum in there just by itself, which to me is so it's like that example you've had of the plants planted along the fence. Whereas the rest of the area, I was encouraging them to put a lot more dense planting. So I think they've realised now they're going to take that out. This is it six months later. So it's already growing quite a bit. And you can see we've got a diversity of low growing plants with grasses, um, ground cover, and there's a space that's going completely around the garden. And they're lucky with lending off some plants off the neighbours as well. Um, this is a Clavelli, it was a um, waterfront property and the clients and I went for a walk along the beach, along the coastal walk, because they're right on that coastal walk. And we looked at what species were growing along the coastal walk, because it was important for them to bring birds into the garden. So then we sort of um, copied that style into their garden. And this is still growing. You can see those grasses again, where I'll come up with lots of low growing shrubs, because just beyond their little fence was the other side of the walk. So those birds and animals that are hanging around in those areas and then just hop over the fence and be in their garden as well. So um, some of the plant species I was interested in because I talked I talking about the, all the local species and I agree that we should put in 50% of the plant species that, from your area. But when I'm at the nursery and I'm meeting clients, they obviously see lots of pretty little things that they want to put in. So I talked to them about using species maybe that they can use um, to create that look thereafter, but also um, beneficial for the animals. You see the bee, this is the lean in the green screen, which has a really nice, dense habit. It's also got quite tiny flowers. We see the bees love it, so it's a good one to use in the garden. Um, Homeranthus, does everyone know Homeranthus? That's quite, because I also get asked to create styles of gardens. So people say, oh, I want native plants, but I want it to be Japanese. So that's <laughs> or something quite formal. So I'm used, I'll try and use plants to have a bit of structure to them, but also create quite a habit for the plant. I don't know if you've ever smelt this plant when it's in flower, but it smells like Anzac biscuits. So it's got a beautiful fragrance to it. So the animals are very attracted to the fragrance. I find when we get into, um, when I think about pest control and insect problems, if you're having more of these sort of fragrant plants in the garden, it can also help as well. Because it can keep some of the pests. I'm sure you're going to talk about that. Anyway, that's um, another really nice, dense, layered, small growing plant that people may not have heard of before. And this one is um, a Lamatia, so the folia. That's, I, a lot of people mistake this for a familiar, but I find this has a really beautiful habit. And although it's got a bigger flower, I find because of the style of that, it actually I've seen lots of very small birds in this habit. I don't know if you've seen it. Do you, you 
reduce that plant. Yeah. So that has quite a, a beautiful habit and its flowers are incredibly um, fragrant. Now, the reason I put the gum in, because obviously this is very fashionable and everyone wants to put in a grass of gum. They're from Western Australia. They're very um, striking and you know very eye-catching, but again, it's for a lot of the larger birds. So I encourage people to use maybe if they want a, a gum to put in something, there's a few um, interesting smaller hybrids, like there's one called Eucalyptus Moon Lagoon, which has a really beautiful small habit and very small flowers. It's got that grey foliage, which is like a silver dollar gum, we all know that, but it's got a very small habit um, and it lends itself more beautifully. These are very beautiful and they're very showy, but it's that large flower that we're trying not to um, attract the big birds with. Solia, you know, sometimes people don't like solia, it can be a bit of a weed um, in some parts of Australia. It's now called the Valaria area, Petrophila. But it's got a beautiful blue flower and it's the habit of this I quite like. Um, I use it on the south side of the colourbond fence because it's a, it's a climber but it also acts like a shrub and it's very dense and I find a lot of the small birds can hide in behind it. Um, has anyone used that before? Solia? Have you used the beach? Solia in the garden? I just think in the end of chains that we do... You're just using local species. Stick to the locals? Yeah. But, um, it's really nice. Yeah, it's really good. Wow. Um, Crinum and Dunculata, I find that there's a lot of, this is sort of a structural plant that I would use in amongst the other shrubs. Um, it attracts a lot of insects, so the birds who like, who like who are insects even like it. And you can see behind it, there's one of the Leptospermum and Bogandies, which has a really beautiful colour to it. So when I'm talking about using different plants that actually the small birds like, but also creating a beautiful design for your garden. So you can use ones that have foliage colour um, and also habitat because the birds actually really love to get in between those kind of lilies. Um, Darwinia, Taxifolia, that's a really great shrub for small birds. It's, it looks spiky than it is, but it's actually got a very um, sweet nectar and it attracts a lot of insects, so the insect eaters really love it. Um, you'll see that through the bush locally. And this one, surprisingly, this is Tecumantifilia, which is a Fraser Island creek bar. And although it's got a bit of a larger flower, I've seen a lot of eastern spine bills on this. This is down, has anyone ever been to the Gravillia Park down at Kulai? Um, that's a really beautiful park. It's open soon, I think. Um, so you can go and have a look there. They've got a lot of species, a lot of local species, but also a lot of species that are from elsewhere. And you can see how they're put into a habitat style garden. Um, Prestantra is the mid bush. I find that they are not only fragrant, but the small birds seem to love the, um, the flowers. So, and that's another fragrant plant that helps either attract or protect, protect the um, insects. It's really dense growing. It gets a little bit woody underneath, but actually that's some that's the part that actually the small birds quite like. It's in that woody structure. You can see it growing with some grasses. Um, Hobias. Do you use hobias in the garden at all? No. Yeah. Yeah. So the pea flowers, I mean, there's a plethora of pea flowers that are local as well. This one sort of always surprises me because it sort of disappears in the garden and then as soon as it comes out in flower, you notice that it's there. Um, I've got a murder specular, which is a rose myrtle. That's a, actually a bush tucker plant. Um, and it attracts a lot of insects, but it also can be quite low growing. One of the things I sort of say to people too, if they're attracted to a local species, but it's gonna to grow too big for their habit, they actually can prune it. It's not like you wake up the next morning and overnight the plants grow to six meters. You actually have time to prune it. So this one actually creates a really nice, small, dense shrub and has root for three meters. Kanzia, Kanzia and Bidua is there's a tick bush, there's also a dwarf variety, there is also a ground cover, um, which you can use for this variety of plant. And the Canadian Niagara can, I've found, is really quite a nice habitat for small birds because it's a very vigorous climber, but again, it gets a lot of woody material underneath, and it's got a very unusual flower that you can see that black and yellow um, flower. So I think that's it for mine, but I find when I'm doing it, because you know you're talking about like having sort of areas in the garden, and it was sort of um, 
creating it sort of to be a little bit messier. People sort of say to me, oh, but I don't want that. But I said, you can still create that same environment and have the grasses and you can have the small shrubs and have the contrasting foliage and the different flowering times and create that and still have your beautiful bird bath in the middle. It won't, it'll look aesthetic to you, especially if you repeat some of those shrubs through the garden, but I find that on the other hand, it can still be a neat garden, but create that habitat for those birds. It doesn't need to be, um, people sort of say, oh, you're a native designer, oh, you just do it, you just make scrub gardens. And it's like, oh, have you visited a native nursery recently? Come and see some examples of the garden, like the one I showed you. You can still create that habitat and have something that's aesthetically pleasing to the eye. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Um, you mentioned, uh, you told us about one of the residents, I think it was Clovelli, who went out and had a look along the coast and yeah. had a look at the vegetation yeah. growing there. Do you find that, is that a good way to introduce the concept to uh, your clients and to talk about how they can connect? Yeah, yeah it is, because I think people have got a bit removed from their gardens. They're sort of not realising they're part of a bigger habitat. And like, it's not just you know, people just put it in their own space. They get outside that space and we walk, like we walked on there and said, what do you like about this space? And they said, oh, it was, you know, there's a lot of activity, there's birds, there's lovely sounds, you know, you can see the plants were all growing beautifully together. And I said, if you're growing this in your garden, one, it's going to be successful because they already grow here, but that's what you want. You want some life in your garden. You don't want it to just be a flat pilot of plants. Yeah. Are there any questions in the room? Uh, my question is, uh, uh, previously it was mentioned that uh, the preferred uh, type of uh, shrubs would be some that are quite dense. And uh, so the question is, is there something like a shrub that might be too dense? Like what comes in mind is like more of a classic uh, shrub in a garden, like uh, an English box. Um, when you say, uh, like, having those would be still like the chief the same, like, how can they track the birds? Well, you need some gaps in the areas where the birds are getting behind it. A lot, of, a lot of plants that can be densely pruned will still have sort of a, a woodiness underneath. They're not all going to be, if they can get in behind that area, but yeah, or even if it's, it has to sort of stop somewhere, like you still need somewhere for the birds to get in, because some of them are so densely pruned, they look in impervious. <laughs> look, you can't get in. What about something like a native species interest? Is that something that you would like to see? Yeah, they do, but it's. They do, you've got to prune it quite a bit because they get a bit, they get sort of create a trunk quite a bit. So I use a lot of bush foods in my gardens and I would do that, but I would also be planting something underneath because they actually become quite open. Yeah, and they're actually quite a shade lover. Interesting. And let's, uh, let's say like she's a like large plant or uh, a little land grass, it's like a one meter tall, which is still enough. Interesting. Like, like, Oh, okay, sorry. So the question, so you're worried if it's just the mandra or if, it's... If, uh, if there's a situation where I can create something larger, but just trappy without, uh, without those bushes, is it still more as, as, a, as a habitat or Using just grasses maybe? Yeah, let's say like just yeah but I would use like a diversity of grasses and local. So, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. So the question was sort of whether, um, if we just use grasses rather than shrubs, whether you could still create that habitat? And the answer is yes, because they could, they, I would use a lot of different species of grasses. I wouldn't use just the mandra. I would use, you would use some poa species or you'd use some persinia or other grasses that are from that area. They will use it as a corridor and there'll be, and also a lot of the grasses like the poas have a lot of um, dieback underneath, so they'll use that. Um, as a sort of protective layer as well. Obviously, if they need nectar or they want to eat insects and then it's not being attracted to that grass, they're obviously going to keep moving along. Like it would be good to have some other shrubs in there as well. You don't want just a little monocultural 
species. That's just as bad as having a row of trees, like you still need something else in there as well. Are there any questions on my question? Oh, the, the main question coming from online is that it's difficult for people online to pick up all the species names and perhaps we can type all these different yeah, species. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I might bring Mark in for a moment now. Prior to the um, we did have a question. We were always asking about shape loving nature. So this is something we're always coming up across in the living connections. Can you give us a few of your favourite shade? I don't think any of them love shade, but a few natives that tolerate the shade. Um, well, there's always the native violets. Um, this quite often when we, we have shady areas, um, it can be difficult for these birds that we focus on um, to live in these areas as well. Um, so we have to maybe go from a heathland type of environment to a more tropical sort of area and borrow um, plants from areas that are more suitable to tropical areas, subtropical. Um, some of the local species though, are um, the hoppush, uh, brainias, and phobaliums. Uh, phobaliums are actually a, a local species. Uh, Monotokas, um, uh, a bush tucker plant, Aust uh, midgen berry, Ostromertus dulcis. Uh, Warrigal greens go quite well uh, in the coastal areas, in the sandy areas. Um, it's it's um, edible species as well, warrigal greens or a native spinach, a fantastic ground cover, uh, very good for um, insects and lizards to, to hide in as well. Um, Diamnellas and lamandras always used as a last resort native species because they're, they're very reliable um, and but they can grow quite vigorously as well but for certain more difficult spots you can use them but quite um, uh, it's very handy to use those as well it's also the dianellas are a, a native edible species for the berries they spread quite well uh, through the berries as well as vegetatively um, the mandras are actually fantastic um, nesting plant as well for the wrens um, they did quite well in the, um, in the shaded areas as well. Just, uh, it's not necessarily one of the species that you might uh, use in your gardens because it's more aesthetically pleasing. Um, but yeah, I, I do like to look at them. And sometimes uh, people do like to look at them. Another species um, of the Lamandra is the Hystrix. Although that tends to grow more uh, sort of in northern areas, northern New South Wales, Queensland, uh, it has a much different look. I find they're, they're similar, but they're much more elegant. They do better still in shaded areas. Uh, they're somewhat taller and they divide quite um, readily as well. They're much more vigorous in these areas. Um, I love some of the ferns. Uh, there's plenty of ferns we can use. Dudia is a favorite of mine, grass fern. It's just got a beautiful color to it, Dudia aspera. Uh, it's got a beautiful red, new foliage uh, color um, that drops back against the darker green, a uh, nice structure of the leaf as well. Um, Bulwara, Eupermacia lorina, is also um, a bush tucker plant. Um, it's got a lovely smell when the flowers are out. Um, it grows quite large. Um, it is local to the Sydney region, but not so much here on the coast. Um, let's see what else we can uh, The Fabaliums are quite good. Monotokas. That, that's probably around it. About it. Well, I just want to like to refer to rather than looking at species, check your local bushland as well, because there's so yeah. many fantastic examples rather than uh, going off list of species lists. Okay. And um, Narelle's question about uh, small gardens. Are there uh, mm -hmm. any plants that you can suggest for a very small space? Well, with small gardens, I always go up the. Um, I would use the the space like using your fences as well to grow things on. So you start there, 
um, using lots of grasses and lots of small shrubs. You can actually fit a lot into a small garden. Like I have vertical gardens have become very popular, which then you can create a garden bed along the base. I mean, um, depends how you want to use your garden. If it's a very, because I do a lot of terraces and a lot of small gardens, but um, putting, I went to one recently in Leichhardt and it, I think it was about four metres by three metres, the garden, but they had crammed a lot into this garden but it depends how you want to use it so i would use put some curves into the garden which actually makes it look bigger anyway and then you can create some more edges and have things creeping out onto the path having your different layers it's actually a more aesthetically pleasing place to be if you just had paving and some fencing so you can actually fit a lot it's just being clever with have, using those vertical spaces making sure you go up as well Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, thank you, Narelle. Um, we're going to hear from Steve now. Uh, Steve is going to present on um, how to sort this into a holistic ecosystem management and how that all ties in with this. So you guys are here, designers, managers, developers. Yes, sorry, designers. Yeah. And managers. No, neither you folks. Garden like garden managers. Horticulturists. Yeah. Thank you. Um, look, I I really enjoyed listening to you guys and I think um, I knew you were coming on with lots of interesting information about you know, plants and how to design ecosystems and different ways to do it. I thought of bringing maybe a slightly different, um, a different take on it and, and dive deep into what a, what is an ecosystem and how can we really nurture one and, and make it thrive. Um, so we might go an amazing looking um, PowerPoint here. But, um, you know, birds, birds are the result of a complex ecosystem. You know, they don't just you don't know, just pop in a shrub and the tops not with it. So how do we how do we look at our ecosystems? How do we manage them? How do we design them to to get to get as many birds as we possibly can? Um, and there's a couple of tools that I use. I just want to introduce you to those fairly quickly. Um, holistic management is one of them. I've just been heard about it about a year ago and just starting to really understand what it's all about. But it's um, Fantastic framework for, for managing ecosystems and looking at um, how ecosystems function. And the other one is permaculture, which I've been uh, sort of dabbling with for about 25 years. I think they're also around me as well. So it also provides a framework for looking at you know the garden as a whole, and hopefully um, you've got some some tools that you can use to to create um, great homes for, for birds to bring as many birds as much life as you can. You're probably all over this. This is probably like year 10 science or year seven science, but I thought I'd show it anyway, because, um, you know, what's the driver? This is a very simple uh, breakdown of a very complex ecosystem. And we're, we're looking at, you know, the plants and the animals and in, in, with a bit of a focus on the soil. Um, you'll notice on the right, we have birds and animals, and they're actually the result of all these other complex systems that are happening and these interactions and these food webs. A lot of it's driven from the soil, um, but there's an equally kind of complex system above the ground as well. Um, starts with the sun, so photosynthesis drives the whole thing. So how do we as designers and managers pump as much sunlight energy into our system as we can, because that's the driver of the whole thing. Um, I'll just, okay. Does anyone, no, I don't have time for Q and A. So um, I think Sue and Narelle's images kind of some of those really, really nailed this one home. So lots of plants, lots of diversity, stacking of plants, different leaf shapes, different leaf colours. Um, have if you can have the maximum number of leaf, like amount of leaf area, you've got the maximum amount of sunlight being captured and pumping energy in the form of sugars down through the roots and into the soil. That energy is feeding. Uh, nematodes, fungi, bacteria, and countless other critters that are living there. So the plants are actually feeding the ecosystem. Um, the other driver to the ecosystem is organic matter. So mulch is really, really important. Um, when you're managing the landscape and you're pruning and making your garden look really nice, 
one thing you can do is the thing in permacosmic called chop and drop. So you just chop or just place carefully and neatly all that material on top of the ground and all your worms and your bacteria, fungi, and things will come and eat that organic matter and turn it into, into good soil, which drives plant growth. We might go, yeah, and so, so all these first or second order critters are being eaten by more complex critters and they're being eaten by more complex, complex critters such as insects and things and then they feed birds. Without this, you wouldn't have those and birds have got nothing to eat. All right, so holistic management, it's a bit complicated, um, but it's really amazing thing. But if we can, I can't really point, but if you look at the ecosystem processes, the water cycle, mineral cycle, community dynamics and energy flow, so the holistic management framework uh, part of it is looking at those functions of the ecosystem and, and as you're managing or designing, how can you maximize those? And talk about energy flow, you know, the energy going into the soil feeds the community dynamics. The more energy, the more community dynamics, which is basically the animals that you're living in the soil. Um, organic matter breaking down is the mineral cycle. Um, those will all improve the water cycle. So if your soil has got more organic matter, it soaks in, soaks in more water, it holds more water, your plants grow better. Um, they're all connected. They're all basically different ways of looking at the same thing, the same ecosystem. Um, but if you can maximize all of those four things, then you probably have more potential for your ecosystem to support birds. Permaculture. Um, again, this quote from permaculture is really interesting, but it's essentially a framework for, for creating ecosystems. It's got a focus on food and providing things that humans need, but it's also all about diversity and, and homes for animals as well. So, you know, you can call on your ethics when you look, when you're designing or when you're managing um, a landscape. Um, very simple ethics, care of the earth. If what you're doing is not under that banner of caring for the earth, maybe think about doing something else. Um, I think Sue mentioned not spraying chemicals. Uh, you know, if we simply start get out the spray can, we just wipe out this whole dynamic system and start killing things. So, so shift into that nurturing and that that life, um, providing life focus. You know, there's the, then you got principles, observe and interact. You should always be looking at your ecosystem. What, you know, what's living here? What what insects are around? Um, you know, can I convince my client that it's okay to have silicon on there? Really, because it's a good thing because it'll food for small birds. Can I? Can we see that? Yeah, sure. They'll, they'll get a bit disordered for a little while, but we can prune them or not. The birds will come and eat the silicon, and the plants will grow back anyway. Um, you know, use and value diversity. So there's a lot of these that you can you can filter your ideas through and your management through. Um, so hopefully, really drive these. This, this web of life. Because the birds, the insectivorous birds anyway, are sort of at the top of that web. Uh, and we as managers and designers can really maximize um, that, that the life in that cycle, the life in that web uh, to get nice birds. I think that's it. Yeah, so check it out. If you haven't looked into holistic management, I recommend it. If you haven't looked into permaculture, that's some good stuff in there. Thanks. Any questions for Steve? Uh, I have worked in watering, um, so I've got a lot of custom trying to sweat plants for watering, but very, very frail. It's water. So the question was how important is water in the landscape, as in ponds and, yeah. and, and still water? Um, oh, look, it, it massively, massively increases the habitat value of a, of a garden, I think. You know, everything needs water, as far as I know. So um, I think if you, if you had a garden without a pond and the same garden with a pond, I think the one with a pond would, have, would probably have more birds because it would have more life. What are the, and your clients, was it this? Oh, I just always concerned about mosquitoes and mosquitoes. Yeah, um, they're easy to manage. I think. 
and mozzies, little fish, these little native Australian fish that will live in a pond quite, quite happily. Uh, and they'll coexist with frogs and insects and well, they'll eat the mozzies. Oh, species? Gudgeons, I think, might be one. Um, I think Korea, there's a pool, pools for ponds. Is a really good resource for, for fish species. Korean Gut Council. Yeah, definitely. If you can incorporate water, for sure, it just adds, it adds that X factor. Yeah, questions in the room. Uh, I have one question rather than the board. Yeah. Uh, how important is this manual habitat for uh, small birds as well as insects? Question about manual habitat. Well, it's a pretty good one for insects, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's pretty dense habitat, but it depends what's growing along the land beside the mangroves I find because mangroves can be very monoculture in themselves. There's still birds that live in there but it's good to have other grasses and shrubs growing beside the mangroves I think, to give them um, some diversity because it can be, you know, you can agree with that. There's insects, great, they love it. Mm. Yeah. I know where there's mangroves, there seems to be little birds around. Mm. I don't know if it's because they're particularly wild kind of areas that are left alone a bit. But um, I know mangroves are really important to fish. <laughs> and they're often quite a long corridor for them to travel along with the birds. So it's a lot of protection along the way. Any specific thoughts on the mangrove corridor? Questions on the Wallach Creek mangrove corridor? I don't, I'm not aware of the Wallach Creek. Oh, I, I know, yeah. I lived just near the confluence of Wallow Creek and Cooks River, and the mangroves near my place are, um, they have a few interesting birds like the uh, mangrove heron and some. Um, Doves, some doves that you don't see everywhere else. But as well as that, there are hundreds of Indian miners, common miners. Every night they go to, to roost in their hundreds. So I'm not sure if that's just an inner city thing. <laughs> um, but I think Narelle's on, on it here with it depends on what's growing beside the mangroves. The mangroves themselves, great fish habitat. And, um, and there's a few birds like the mangrove heron that are kind of specific to there, that's their niche. But yeah, it depends what, what's next. And Walleye Creek, um, they've, you know, it's around Tamela Station. They've built right out from the creek line with all sorts of other plants like reeds and grasses like Phragmites and, and other shrubs to increase the habitat for small birds. And there's quite a few small birds in that other planting, not in the mangroves themselves. So, Michelle, are there any questions online? Um, no. Barbara's got a hand up. Barbara, can I just like a question? Or, or can she just ask it out loud? Um, yes, it's um, Barbara Schaffer here. It's um, um, thank you. Sorry, I am just on a train, but it's a fabulous workshop. Thank you so much. I just wanted to know: Has anybody noticed that the Banksia integrifolias in the Bondi North Bondi area are dying? The larger trees, and if yeah. Is dying. I was talking to someone recently who was an arborist and he said there's a new disease. I don't know whether you do. Have you heard about this? I'm not an arborist. I don't know about diseases of trees that much, but I do know that um, the vaccine and contributory is around Waverley, LGA, um, are the first to drop leaves in storms. And sometimes the whole 
two goes over. Um, I think sometimes there's some human intervention in um, a vaccine to control your deaths as well around that area. Um, but it's quite possible that um, there's insect and other disease factors going on as well. And I, I'm not sure no one started any research but maybe it's a climate change I think. Yeah. Um, yeah but there's, there's something going on yeah. yeah in our street alone there are two trees which are probably within 25 approximately 25 years old which have basically just died sometimes um, one suggestion on the chat is that it could be yeah, I think we might wrap it up there. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending, those of you in the room tonight, and thank you to everybody joining us online tonight, and thank you for bearing with all our camera movements as we. Uh, maneuvered around the room. Um, so there have been questions about resources and the slides being available. We, hope we will and we'll send an email out and this uh, the workshop's been recorded so you can get a link to that. We'll send slides out uh, where we can. We'll put together a resource list where you can go find more information and um, some suggested species as well. Um, I hope you found that useful tonight. Um, I think we will finish off there, so thank you very much for joining us.